Hi everyone, Dr. Hall here. So moving on with our discussion on sexually transmitted infections, we just finished talking about parasites. And now we're going to move into the bacterial STIs, starting with syphilis. Before we do, just a reminder, the three bacterial STIs we're going to be learning about in class are chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. And I just want to introduce you to, so I grew up in New York State in the 70s, which is a really interesting time. And this is actually a YouTube link, uh, which should also be in the description below, of a commercial that was actually aired on television when I was a kid. And so just to explain, VD, or venereal disease, is what we used to call sexually transmitted infections. Uh, so VD was the phrase back then in the 70s, and uh, you really owe it to yourself to watch watch this commercial. It's just awesome. All right, so I want to tell you some of the main concepts that apply to all the bacterial STIs. So a reminder that there's the big three that we're going to be talking about, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. For all of these, they are typically curable. So we can treat these successfully with antibiotics in almost all cases in this country. So that's really important to know. There are some other types of STIs that once you have it, you just kind of have it for the rest of your life. That's not the case with bacterial STIs. If you've had it once, however, that doesn't mean you can't get it again. So having a previous infection does not make you immune. So if you've had chlamydia in the past, guess what? You can get it again. So just kind of like strep throat where you can get that multiple times. Uh, same thing applies for all of the bacterial STIs. So infection does not make you immune. You can get them multiple times. This is different uh, compared to some of the viral ones that we're going to talk about. And then finally, these can't be transmitted by fomites, right? So we talked about in the parasites, you could potentially get pubic lice from a tanning bed or trichomonas from a toilet seat. It's not common, but it can happen. Uh, that doesn't happen with the bacterial STIs. You need direct contact with infected tissue or fluids. Okay, so we're going to move on and talk about each one in detail. This is a microscopic image of the bacterium that causes syphilis. It's what's called a spirochete bacteria, and you can see why it has this spiral or corkshoe corkscrew shape to it, um, which is just super cool unless you're the one infected with it, but it's just really neat looking under the microscope. So syphilis is really important historically for several reasons. One is because we're pretty sure actually now, and this was a debate until fairly recent in the science, recently in the scientific community, but we're quite sure that syphilis was actually brought to Europe by this person pictured here. So perhaps you recognize him, perhaps you don't. It turns out this is, oh, let me give you a hint. Does that help? <laughs> so this is none other than Christopher Columbus. So syphilis, or kind of a progenitor disease of syphilis, was already present in North America, North and Central America, when Christopher Columbus and his crew arrived in the Americas. And while they were here, many of them had sex with the native population, often under force, and some of them brought some of the women on board with them and took them as slaves and uh, they got infected with syphilis and then they returned to Europe and then we see very soon after 1492 all of a sudden the first cases of syphilis in Europe start cropping up. Uh, it's really interesting so Charles VIII of France actually was really keen on invading and conquering and acquiring Naples and uh, when his soldiers did and they finally went into Naples. Naples already had syphilis because Christopher Columbus and his men had brought it there. And then when the troops went back home, they basically spread it throughout all of France. And so for a while it was called the French disease, but then the French called it the Italian disease. Oops, kitty. All right. So uh, 
that's when it first started to spread around Europe. And many historical figures are believed to have had syphilis. There's some debate whether um, Henry VIII might have actually had syphilis and that that was the cause of the chronic non-healing wound he had on his leg and perhaps cause of his senility and death eventually. Um, Ivan the Terrible, we're pretty sure, had syphilis. People conjecture that uh, Shakespeare may have had syphilis. Stop it. Sorry, cat. Because he developed a tremor in his 30s, which is really unusual to have a shaky hand. Um, so there's lots of interesting historical cases of syphilis. Another important piece of the history of syphilis is uh, really unfortunate, actually. So in the early parts of the 20th century, so early 1900s, a study started in Tuskegee, Alabama. And what they did was they enrolled black men in the South, in the Tuskegee area, who had syphilis. And the purpose of the study was to observe them over time and then better understand the things that syphilis infection does to people over time. When the study was first begun, there was no known treatment for syphilis at all. Um, we had yet to discover an effective treatment for syphilis. Many things had been tried historically, including uh, mercury, the metal, actually. Um, so the phrase was, uh, spend a night in the arms of Venus and be consigned to a lifetime on mercury. <laughs> but um, it worked, but then it poisoned you with mercury poisoning. So anyway, when this study began in Tuskegee, there was no known treatment for syphilis. So it wasn't unethical that they were just going to kind of follow these people over time and see what occurred to them. But what was unethical is that they did not explain to the men in the study that they had syphilis. And they just said, oh, you have bad blood. They didn't explain to them that it was a sexually transmitted infection. They didn't explain that they could be giving it to their partners, nor did they explain that their partners could be giving it to their unborn babies. Uh, so, so there was a real problem there with this study initially from the get-go. So the subjects were not properly informed to really give consent. Things went from bad to worse when then in the 30s and 40s, really in the 1940s for the most part, we discovered that penicillin treats syphilis. And so there was a treatment available. The people who were doing this study, however, said, well, we can't treat these men who have syphilis because that'll make our study invalid. The whole point is to see what happens over somebody's lifetime as they have syphilis. Right, so this is a shameful episode in the history of American medicine. And um, because we withheld treatment, right? So we harmed these men. Many of them died from their syphilis and that could have been prevented. So we took advantage of people who did not understand the purposes of the study for which they were being recruited. We didn't explain to them fully what was going on. And then we did not give them the treatment that we knew would improve their lives and perhaps even save their lives in some cases. So this is a really um, shameful uh, episode in our history, and the only, the only positive, the only silver lining here um, is that it, when this became uh, public, and it wasn't until the 60s and 70s that people realized this study was still happening, that uh, there was outrage, of course, right? This is absolutely unethical. And so it prompted our government to put in place many of the safeguards that we now have for medical research today. Before I move on and tell you a little bit about those, there's also another video that I'm going to ask you to watch that talks about the Tuskegee syphilis study and then also talks about a syphilis study in Guatemala that then occurred afterwards. And if you can believe it, it was even worse. So I just want to say that sometimes we need to be really, really careful because that, that we have good oversight of any type of experimentation that is being done, any type of research that's being done, because sometimes these researchers are themselves unethical or maybe even evil people, or maybe they're not, but they get so um, blinded and siloed that they don't realize what they're doing. So oversight is 
absolutely important, especially of vulnerable populations. So I love Maya Angelou. We've seen this quote before when we talked about teratogens, right? So do the best you can until you know better, and then when you know better, do better. So that's what we've tried to do. So in terms of research today, all research that involves human subjects has to be approved and monitored by an institutional research board. And there are multiple criteria that must be met. So first, you have to maintain the privacy and the confidentiality of the information that you're collecting about these people, similar to how we would in medical care. You also have to have things in place to safeguard the patient's health and well-being. You cannot do things to patients that might be dangerous to them um, unless they, they are fully aware of all the dangers and they give their permission. And even then, if it's something potentially really dangerous, it will not be allowed, even if, even if the patient wants to go ahead and try it. You also have to explain to the participants all of the potential risks and benefits. They have to be fully informed for what they're signing up for. That's called informed consent, and that's a really important piece of this. And then there also have to be procedures in place to detect and appropriately respond to any harm to the patients. So sometimes in medical trials, they'll have to call it off early because they'll be like, oh my gosh, we thought this medicine was going to be helpful, but it actually is causing harm to the patients. So we're going to stop the study early because we need to keep people safe. So ethics in research today, we've come a long way, but it still requires continual vigilance to make sure these standards are upheld. For those of you who are curious, there's also a board that has to approve any research performed on animals as well. It doesn't apply to insects, but it applies to other animals. So let's come back to the history of syphilis. And so we've been keeping data on syphilis for almost the last 100 years. And so what I'm going to ask you to pay attention to here in this um, graph is this top line. These are total numbers of cases of syphilis diagnosed in the United States, so that top dotted line. So what we can see is in the 1940s, in the early 1940s, there was a lot of syphilis going around. So I say, well, what was happening? Well, World War II was happening, um, and so there were all these soldiers who were going to go off to war, and some of them were like, well, I don't want to die a virgin, right? Or maybe they had this steady girlfriend, and they were like, oh, maybe we should, you know, have sex now before I go off, because who knows if I'll come back or, or what may happen. And so um, we saw this huge increase in syphilis cases, as well as you can see from the poster gonorrhea. And so they had to do this huge public education campaign. They produced all these posters, right? So this says, she may look clean but pickups, good time girls, and prostitutes spread syphilis and gonorrhea. And then I love the tagline. It says, you can't beat the Axis, that was the enemies, Germany and Japan, if you get VD, right? So somehow if you got gonorrhea, you weren't going to be able to be an effective soldier. But so then we see soon afterward a huge decline in the number of syphilis cases. You might say, well, those posters were super effective, but it actually wasn't just the public education campaign. It was actually that we discovered that penicillin can cure syphilis. So what we're looking at here is a petri dish of the penicillium mold, which is what created the initial uh, drug penicillin and this smeary thing out here is bacteria and you can see that no bacteria can grow close to the penicillin because it kills them. So we discovered that penicillin could treat syphilis and so the numbers of cases went down quite a bit. Then we see a little bit of a bump in the 90s. And so this was the onset of rave culture, uh, these late night crazy parties. And so we had a bump, an increase in syphilis cases, and then they came down again in the early 90s as a result of HIV. So HIV came on the scene in the early 90s and all of a sudden there was a lot more talk about safer sex and a lot of motivation to use condoms or to engage in less risky behaviors because now there was a disease out there that could kill you and about which very little was known at that time. So it looks like, okay, so then syphilis cases went down pretty low and we have this thing pretty much in the bag and under control. 
Well, unfortunately, since the early 2000s, we have started to see a gradual increase in cases of syphilis, particularly in male-bodied persons. Ugh. Why, right? Why is this happening? Well, probably for a couple of reasons. One is that we saw the rise of internet-based hookups. So Craigslist and Manhunt.net and all kinds of these other platforms started cropping up that allowed people to find partners, anonymous partners, that they could hook up with for casual sex. And so this had a huge impact. You may think that, oh, that only was an issue in places like New York City or San Francisco, but these are actually some of the casual encounter ads for our area, northwestern Wisconsin, um, about a year ago. And this is just, you know, a couple of days worth of these ads. And you can see there's lots of people that are putting these ads out there. And I can tell you from our public health um, comrades, colleagues, they tell us people do answer these, right? So if you just want to have quick anonymous sex with no strings attached, this was um, a great way to make that happen. So Congress last year passed a new law that actually made Craigslist and other website domains potentially liable if any of these ads turned out to be uh, prostitution rings. And so because of that, these um, sites for casual encounters have since been taken down in almost all of these platforms. So maybe that will help bring syphilis back down. It'll be interesting to see. So, you know, the online anonymous sex was problematic from a public health standpoint in several ways. It was much easier to arrange casual sex via the internet, right? So in the olden days, you had to go to a bar, you had to try to be there at the same place as somebody else who wanted to just have an anonymous hookup, and then you have to kind of figure out who's interested and make your overtures and all that kind of stuff. So it was doable and it obviously happened, but it was a little bit more difficult, time intensive and less convenient. So once these online abilities uh, kind of cropped up, these casual encounters became much more common and it was much easier for people to have a very high number of sexual partners in a very short period of time. And we definitely saw that occurring. Also in a situation like this with anonymous uh, casual sex, there's little to no incentive for the participants to be honest with each other. So you're not necessarily going to say uh, whether you have a history of an STI or be honest about your past condom use or last time you got tested, right? Who cares? This person doesn't know you from Adam and they'll never see you again. Also, people wouldn't usually give their name or number. At most, there might be a username, uh, so there are no strings attached. But then, if it turned out somebody got infected, we had no way of knowing who they had been with, right? So we couldn't track down and notify contacts, right, and tell them, hey, you might have this infection. Let's get you tested. Let's get you treated. And then let's also figure out who your contacts were, right? So we couldn't do any contact tracing. So it was very problematic. So those online casual hookups really were part of what fueled that increase in syphilis cases. The other thing um, that has been found to contribute is the increasing rates of crystal meth use. Crystal meth as a drug tends to cause a significant increase in sexual activity and libido in general, as well as risk taking. So um, people started engaging in a lot more risky sex, um, sometimes because then they were um, having sex in order to get the drug, but sometimes just because the drug made them more likely to engage in risky sexual behavior. So just a little PSA from uh, the sheriff's department, right? So here is an image of some people at their first arrest for crystal meth possession. And uh, we're going to see a kind of a time lapse and then um, a subsequent arrest down the road. And you can see the devastating impacts of this drug. So I'm just going to put it out there. If anybody ever offers this to you, just say no. I know that sounds really crazy and corny, but um, this is one of those drugs that people become really addicted to really quickly and is just devastating.
All right, so we're gonna go back to syphilis now. So we talked a lot about the history of syphilis. What does it actually do to you, right? So what happens if you get syphilis? Well, if you get it and you don't get treated, it typically goes through three separate stages. So we're gonna talk about those. The first stage is called primary syphilis. So about 10 to 90 days after exposure, after you get infected, so a week to three months, right? So it can be really hard to pin down where you got it from. You're gonna develop something that looks like a sore, but it doesn't hurt. So it's a firm, painless ulcer called a chancre. And you're gonna get it at the place where you got infected. So here we see one on a penis. Here's another one on a penis that's a very common location, as you can imagine. Here's one on the vulva. And here's one, right, just near the lip. So wherever you get kind of inoculated, wherever you get exposed, that's where you're going to get the chancre. Now, these are chancres that are in places that you can see. But as you can imagine, you could also get this inside the vagina where you couldn't see it, inside the anus or the rectum where you couldn't see it, or even inside the mouth where you might not be able to see it or feel it. And since it doesn't cause any pain, if you have it in a place where you can't see it, you won't even know that you have it. And this, this lesion, this chancre, is full of those spirochete bacteria. And and so you're very highly contagious at this stage. Interestingly too, this chancre will go away on its own in about a month. So sometimes, you know, I remember we diagnosed somebody about a decade ago when I was at a different university and they said, oh, well, yeah, I did have this thing on my penis, but it didn't hurt and it went away. So I figured, oh, it was fine, <laughs> right? So, um, so that is primary syphilis. If it's not caught and treated, you can then progress to secondary syphilis. So secondary syphilis will happen one to six months later, and oftentimes people will get a rash. So you can see several examples of the rash here. One all over the body almost looks a little bit like measles or chicken pox or something. Another one on the face almost looks like a bad case of acne. And then you see these pictures of people's palms of their hands and soles of their feet. So there aren't very many infections that will cause a rash on your palms and soles. Syphilis is one of them. Them. In fact, that patient that I described earlier, we figured out that he had syphilis because he came in with fatigue and body aches, which you can see here is listed as one of the symptoms of secondary syphilis. And the doctor who was evaluating him had him get completely undressed, checked him from head to toe, and found two small spots on the bottom of his foot. <laughs> All right, so that's how they figured it out. So this rash is contagious. This rash actually has bacteria in it. And sometimes these lesions can be really subtle, right? So if you just have a couple spots on the bottom of your foot, right, you may not even notice it. So you'll also see here, I said that not only can you have a rash, sometimes you can have some strange looking warts. I'll show you what those look like. Right, so these look kind of like regular warts, but kind of different actually. And I know we haven't done warts yet, but we will. And it looks like here is probably where this person's chancre was, and that is healing. And now they have these funny warts, very strange, kind of waxy looking. All right, there's some perianal ones. And secondary syphilis will also go away on its own, even if you don't get treated. <laughs> And then you can still have syphilis in your body for decades, be potentially infectious to other people until you eventually develop tertiary syphilis. So tertiary syphilis, tertiary means third, so that's the third stage. And this can happen a couple of years or 50 years after the initial infection. You can get these weird tumors right, in your soft tissues like your muscle and skin. You can also get infection of your liver, your bones, your heart, and your brain. So the brain symptoms are often very prominent. It can cause a dementia. Heart problems are very common with tertiary syphilis, and tertiary syphilis can kill you because of its effects on the brain and the heart. And in fact, that's who what this gentleman died from. Uh, you may recognize him, you may not. That is Al Capone, the famous mobster, and he actually died from tertiary syphilis. So how do you actually get syphilis? 
Well, so you get exposed to a chancre or another lesion, like one of those weird warts or a rash, and it can get into your body via broken skin. So even a, a small break, like a little nick from shaving, for example, sometimes can be enough. That's probably how that gentleman who had it uh, near his lower lip probably got it that way or intact mucous membrane. So a mucous membrane is the urethra, the vagina, the anus and the rectum, uh, the mouth, right? So these, these kind of goopy parts of us are our mucous membranes. So syphilis is almost always sexually acquired and about a full 20% of it is transmitted by oral sex. So you can imagine if you're performing oral sex on somebody who has a vulva and they have a chancre inside the vagina, you can't see it, right? And they can't feel it so you don't know it's there. Uh, so definitely oral sex can transmit syphilis. So condoms can help, right? But they may not cover all the areas that are potentially infectious, right? So if you have a condom on your penis, that's excellent. But if you have some of those funny warts off on the scrotum, that's not going to help because it may not cover the area that is infectious. The nice thing about condoms is that they will help protect you from exposure to those places you cannot see, right? So they can definitely be helpful. The other way you can get syphilis is if you are a baby inside an infected woman. So that's called vertical treatment transmission or congenital syphilis where an infected mother gives syphilis to the baby and that can be devastating. It causes terrible um, nervous system problems and brain damage. So definitely want to avoid that. So how do we know if somebody has syphilis? So we're going to do a blood test actually. Our initial screening test is not highly accurate, uh, so similar to other screening tests we've learned about in this class. So if that's positive, then we'll do a definitive test to confirm it. And the thing about these tests is it can sometimes take weeks after getting infected for the test to turn positive. So um, there's this kind of incubation period during which the person is infectious. Uh, they may or may not have symptoms, but they will test negative even though they can still transmit it to somebody else. So that's something to keep in mind with syphilis and one of the reasons why probably it still is around in humans. So in summary, we have talked now about the first of our bacterial STIs and remember all the bacterial STIs require direct transmission, can be cured with antibiotics, but you do not develop lasting immunity, you can be reinfected with them. Syphilis has a long history brought to Europe by Columbus. Many historical figures had it, and we had shameful abuses in the Tuskegee syphilis study and even worse abuses of participants in Guatemala. And we seemed to get it under control once we discovered that penicillin uh, could treat effectively, but there have been some recent increases in syphilis rates due to online hookups and crystal meth. Three stages of infection, so primary syphilis is that painless chancre uh, that you may or may not see. Secondary syphilis, you can have a fever, rash, some strange warts, you're still contagious, um, and tertiary, which can be fatal. So the way you get it is with some type of contact to an infected lesion, so a ward, a rash, a chancre that comes into contact with broken skin or intact mucous membranes like the urethra, the vagina, the anus, or the throat. There's a blood test, uh, which is great, but that can take weeks to turn positive, and a highly effective treatment with penicillin. So that's it for syphilis. We'll pick up next time talking about gonorrhea and chlamydia.